106, dead into the wind. Gonna hit the pitching wedge, a little punched one. As long as we clear that bunk on the left, we're fine. But I would prefer to be just right of the pin or directly over the pin. One hundred and seventeen yards, perfect. Now we just hit another fifty-four. Lots of green left. No need to, no need to go too tight to that bunker. I'm going to go at the pin. If it draws, I'm fine. If it's straight, I'm perfect. Guys, honestly, this is where we can capitalize. These par threes are not very long off the white tees. Anything around 160, 150, 140 yards, we really can make par on, okay? This one's a bit into the wind. I'm not hitting the ball the best today, ballooning it a little bit. But I mean, anywhere right of this pin is fine. As long as I clear that water, we've got a chance at a par. Admittedly guys, I haven't played this very well. I'm ballooning the ball again, probably falling back onto my old swing. I've got to get back into the new swing. that okay I was going to do this in text form but I don't think anyone wants to read anything so the difference between the chrome soft and the hard balls the Volvix was quite massive in terms of around the green what I like to do in in anything in golf is to work backward from the green so when it comes to practice when it comes to equipment selection in the bag when it comes to planning a hole and when it comes to golf balls I just base every single thing around the green and then move further back so when it comes to golf balls that's why i play the chrome soft why i play the project a by taylor made why i play the strixon ad333 tour why i play the tp5 um, these are all balls with urethane covers and what i do is i like to go and feel the ball off the putter face that's the most important thing for me is how the ball feels on the face of the putter second most important is how it feels off my chipping clubs 
because these balls also rip a bit further back when I'm hitting wedges into the green. So instead of stopping a yard in front of the pitch mark, they might stop maybe a yard or two behind or exactly on the pitch mark. What I like is when a ball stops exactly on the pitch mark because it means that's gone as far as I want it to go. When they rip back too far, that's not ideal either unless you're planning on it and hitting it further past the hole. Now, when I talk about working back from the green, my main concept is, okay, so I've got the ball covered. I've got the putts and I've got the chips. That's all I worked on, mostly, mostly when I used to practice. You can see from my iron shots, I don't practice my iron shots much. I normally miss greens all the time. I'm always chipping and putting. But once you get good at chipping and putting, it takes pressure off the rest of your game. So when you're approaching the green, you're not so worried about sticking it close. I used to play off scratch, and when I played off scratch, I used to go at the pin every single hole regardless of where it was because I never wanted a lag putt because my putting sucked so much. I've only become a good lag putter in the last year and a half that I've actually been playing golf again after I gave up for four years because I got so frustrated with it. Now with this system, it's very important to remember that you don't necessarily... Wait, let me switch off the aircon. Now with this system, it's very important to note I'm not saying hit 150 yards of the tee. What I'm showing you is what you can do with the minimum amount required. So I was hitting an eight iron off the tee and then a couple wedges into the greens. Now imagine if you had a very reliable club, a go-to club, something like a hybrid, a fairway wood, maybe a five or seven wood, maybe a five iron off the tee, something that could even go as far as 170 yard carry or 160 yard carry. That's gonna make a very big difference to your game and you'll start to be able to go for longer holes in two on the par fours and in three on the par fives. Now that's gonna cut score way down. What I've shown you is really bare bones. Now with the system, you are splitting your shots up, but there's a big difference between splitting your shots up from 250 and then splitting your shots up from 180. Now if you don't have a club that it can go 180, let's say you have a club that goes 150, are you happy with a 20 or 30 yard pitch onto the green? Because if you're not, I would suggest hanging it back to a comfortable position. So if you're more comfortable from 60 yards, maybe you could hit a 120 yard shot and then a 60 yard shot onto the green. If you have a club that goes a certain distance, like let's say 180 yards, just be careful that you know the carry distance. So when you're thinking about going for that shot, you know that you can carry whatever trouble you have to go to. Because very often we just think, copy, paste, copy, paste. I hit a six iron 160 yards. In this moment, I'm going to hit the six iron 160 yards. We don't realize that the reason we think we hit 160 yards is because it lands 153 and rolls seven. So always know your carry distance and only ever hit those top of your range shots. So let's say your top of the range shot you have is 180 yards with maybe your four hybrid or three hybrid. Now that, that top range of your distance is that really the top range, the distance you hit it 80% of the time, or is that the distance you've hit it one out of 10 or two out of 10 times? When, because it's very difficult when you've got a shot that's 185 yards to pull the three hybrid, because now you've got to give it another extra five. You're already not sure it goes 180. You think it's more like 172. So now you're going to have to give it a little bit extra. And what happens when you do that is duff, or slice in the woods, or a little mole raper along the ground into the water. So what you want to do is know your distance perfectly and if you're at the top range of your distance with your top range club from the fairway or on a par 3, maybe think about scaling it back, getting yourself into a position where you can hit a, the next shot from a comfortable position. Because let's say you have that 185 yard shot and you pull it off perfectly. Let's say you have a 15 yard pitch over a bunker. Are you more comfortable with that shot or are you more comfortable with a 65 yard lob wedge or sand wedge onto the green where you know you can go over the pin and over that bunker easily yeah that's something to keep in mind a lot of people will say oh but this is not fun this is not real golf you know it's not really fun to play golf like this it's so boring if you're not going for driver and trying to make birdies and eagles yeah i get it when you play with a single figure handicap, I get it. But when you're trying to break 100 and you're trying to break 90, what are you talking about, man? I'll tell you what. Go take your 7 iron, go take your sandwich, and go take your putter to the course next time, and then play 18 or 9 holes with just those three clubs, and then tell me it wasn't fun. 
Tell me that is not the most fun you can possibly have on a golf course. And then tell me you didn't learn something. I mean, I can go out there with 14 clubs and I can go bash it all over the place without thinking. Without thinking, just bash it, bash it. I can shoot an 85. You give me a six iron, you give me a sand wedge and you give me a putter, I guarantee you I will not shoot an over an 82. Nowhere near. I guarantee it'll be an 80. Do you know why? Because when you're hitting those shots, there's no pressure. You have no decision paralysis. You're not wondering, oh, should I hit the driver here? Oh, but there's out of bounds right and then there's water left and I tend to push the driver, but I, I pull the three wood. Oh, I said, I can't hit a three iron because the hole's 420 yards. No, you just hit the six iron, you hit the six iron, you hit another punch six iron or you hit the sandwich into the green and you walk off with a maybe a par, but you walk off with a bogey and you think, you know what, that's a well-earned bogey. And then what happens, you get into a comfort zone and you start to take the pressure off yourself and you start to realize you, that's all you got in the back. So there's no pressure about where you're going to hit it, how far you got into the green. Because there ain't nothing else, man. Now, if you do that and you follow this type of system, those times when you're breaking those 250-yard shots and those 200-yard shots and those 180-yard shots up into two shots, whether you're splitting them up equally or whether you're splitting them up into 160 yards and a 60-yard shot, whatever is comfortable for you. In the future, when you start dropping those scores down under 90, those shots are the ones you're going to come back to when you're trying to break 80. Those are the exact shots that are going to make you break 80. Those are the exact shots that are going to bring your handicap down from 20 down to 12. And then once you're down to 12, maybe you introduce a nice custom fit driver. Maybe you get yourself a nice mini driver, a nice fairway wood or a hybrid, a real go-to club with the tee. Now with that, you'll add another shot to the arsenal with extra distance. This is not brain surgery. It's not high level. All you have to do is get a core group of five or six clubs that you can develop from when you're breaking 100. You just keep hitting the same shots, to keep hitting the same shots till you become so good at them that they, be they become the center and the core of your game. Now, yeah, sure, it's not fun. You're not hitting a driver 250 and then you're not hitting the forward onto the par, the par five and two. How many par fives have you eagled or birdied Going for them in two when you shouldn't be. The main thing you have to do with any round of golf is you have to drop the ego and you have to drop your expectations. So when we talk about ego, I'm talking not only about you wanting to hit the longest shot. I'm also talking about the ego of not wanting to look like a bit of a girl who doesn't want to hit the ball far and you want to just hit a six iron off the tee while your buddy's all hitting driver out of bounds. I mean, drop it, guys. Enjoy the game. What's better? Losing... 10 chrome softs around and losing, what's that? I don't know, $700, who knows? These things are damn expensive. Or keeping the ball in play, taking the ball out of the 18th hole and going, God damn, man, that's the first time I ever finished a round with one ball. That's more satisfying than losing three and knocking a shot off your score, believe me. Next, the expectations are not only your expectations because our expectations of ourselves when we go to the golf course is, we shot 99 the previous round, easy life, I'm shooting 85 this time. And what do we do? We shoot 120. Not only must you drop your expectations, you have to forget the expectations of others as well on the course. Because what they are starting to do is expect you to play a certain way. And when you don't play that way, it shakes them to the core. And they're going to give you a ribbing and yeah, they're going to give you some needle. But stick to the system, stick to your guns. Play the safe, simple, stress-free shot in any given moment. And those same guys giving you shit are going to be asking, what the hell did you do to drop 10 shots of your score? Guaranteed. Now, with that in mind, don't count your score in your head. The expectations that you come to the golf course are that this is a par 4, I must make a par. This is a par 5, I must make a 5. Are you nuts, guys? My sister just started playing golf and she shot 111 in her third round, which is unreal. She doesn't even understand how good that is. But now because in the scorecard it says this hole is a par 4, this hole is a par 5, that now gets into her head and many of our heads where we go, this is a par 5. I mean, 5 is the score. Anything worse than a 5 is useless. I mean, may as well not even play golf if I can't make a 5 or a 4. I mean, a par? Come on, man. But the problem is we have these terms, par, bogey. Double bogey, birdie, eagle, triple. Guys, 
if you're really serious about bringing your score down and you're shooting from 91 up to 120, forget the names, bogey, par, double, triple, birdie, whatever. Forget it. All it is is three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's all you need to know. You take a scorecard, you write it down in the scorecard. There's no, there's no name. It's just a number. And then part of that is not counting your score in your head. You can't come to a golf course and be like, all right, that's me. I need to do bogey here, bogey here, bogey here, par there, par there. And then once you don't do it, and now you've associated the score on that hole with a bad word, like a double bogey or triple bogey, immediately your, your mind goes into this, oh, I've made a triple. I've made a triple. I better not make another triple. I need to make another par to save that triple. So all you've done is you just change the wording and you've made yourself nuts. Whereas a number means nothing. A five, what is a five? What is an eight? What is a three? Doesn't mean anything. Put it in the scorecard. Don't count it in your head. Don't go, okay, I'm seven over after three holes. Forget it, bruh, forget it. We'll count it afterwards with the first beer in hand, okay? When you're sipping the froth off the top of your beer, someone else will be counting that score and they'll tell you once you've had the first sip and then when they tell you that you've shot an 88, that the rest of that beer is gonna taste like heaven, baby. Now, part of that too is do not count your score halfway. Do not, never ever do that. And if your friends do that and you've asked them not to and they still do it, find new friends. A lot of you may, may be asking questions about ball striking and how to hit the ball more consistently. To be fair and to be honest with you and not to uh, take you for a ride and pretend like I know what I'm talking about, there's only a couple principles I know of for hitting a golf ball because I actually don't know how the swing works. Principle number one for me is that you have to complete the swing. That's it. You take it back and when you go through, you have to finish the swing. That's it. Number one, finish the swing. Number two, what is number two? See, that's how little I know. So if I were you, and you're finding that, after, that you've been playing the game for a little while, and you've just got too many things in your head, because most of the time we hit a bad shot. It's not because, or we have a bad swing. It's not because we have a bad swing. Most people have a pretty natural good golf swing, actually. There's a lot of people who've never played a, a bat and ball sport in their life and they may have some trouble with the hand-eye coordination of swinging a club toward a ball. If you've played tennis, if you've played cricket, baseball, hockey, these kind of things, it's quite easy to get the motion. But if you're more like a rugby or football player, it could be, or well, soccer player, it could be a bit more difficult to get that rhythm of hitting a ball. Now, with either of you, the guy who can't hit the ball properly because he hasn't, uh, or doesn't have a natural swing, because he hasn't played bat and ball sports, and then the guy who does. It's the exact same thing. It's a doubt, it's a, it's a fear, it's a self-doubt that produces a bad swing. You generally don't have a bad swing. There's only two things that go wrong when you have a bad swing. Number one is you're too ball focused. So you're looking at that ball and you're just hitting at the ball instead of right through the ball and finishing your swing. Because for me, the only concept to a golf swing is to finish it. I have no idea how to construct a golf swing. The only thing I know is that you have to finish it. And part of finishing it is hitting it through the ball. You can't be hitting down at, you know, you can hit down at the ball, but not focusing on the ball. You have to be focusing on hitting toward the end of your swing. So when you find that you're hitting it fat and you're hitting it thin and you're hitting it right and you're hitting it left, it's because you've become so ball focused instead of finishing the swing focused. And sometimes what I do is I'll, uh, I won't look at the ball. I'll just look an inch or two in front of the ball if I'm finding that I'm starting to hit at it. And that way, I, I like to get the club to that place two inches in front of the ball, meaning that I'm going to be through the ball. And then I like to hold my finish at the end, especially at the driving range. The other problem is that we start to doubt ourselves. And then we just, get, we just spiral out of control. And we start to self-diagnose our problems when we know nothing about the swing ourselves. We start watching YouTube videos from this guy, that guy, me and my golf. We start watching from Crossfield. We start watching from Finch and we start watching from Clement and all these guys. And yeah, well, all of them have valid points. None of them have seen your swing and your swing is unique to you. And none of them understand, or maybe they do understand, but it's not like they're catering to it, that it's up here. You guys are screwing yourselves like I do 
when you talk yourself out of a shot. When you talk yourself out of a shot, what you're doing is you're taking that perfectly good swing that you have if there was no ball there, and now you're telling yourself, don't hit it right. You're telling yourself, don't slice it out of bounds. Don't hook it left into the water. There's, you know, you start to doubt. You may hit perfect, you may hit perfect drives all day, and now suddenly you're thinking, oh, don't screw this up. And just those little thoughts in the end spiral you out of control to the point where you turn yourself into a pretzel, you get tense, and your swing changes. It does change, but it's not because your swing sucks. It's because your head sucks. So what you have to do is unfuck your swing, which is what it's called. And the best place I have found for that, to be fair, is Robin Matthews Williams. Now, a lot of you may not like his language and his attitude, or you know, may, he may rub you up the wrong way, but his points are valid. It's all about too much thinking. You, you stand, I mean, I can watch a guy. I played with a guy the other day, and uh, he may be on the channel in future. Um, but what he does is before his shot, he steps up and he looks confident and he feels great. And he stands and he, he addresses the ball. And you can actually see this when he's wearing shorts. His calves, his calf muscles tense up like that just before he's about to hit. And his hands, you can see it. There's, a, there's a one second when he's standing over the ball when you think he should take the club away. And he knows he should take the club away. But you can see there's just one second. It lasts very short time. And that's when you can see the hole in his head opening up and the demons start flooding in because he grips it tighter and he takes one second too long. And that's when the demons flood in and he hits his shot. And after hitting a 250 yard drive, he dumps one in the water 20 yards away. He shanks it right. He hooks it left. He hits a mole raper along the ground. These are all from your thoughts. And the only way to exterminate these thoughts is to follow things like Robin Matthews Williams, no look swing. The, I think it's a four step swing the six step swing, the step, the, the walk in swing. Um, these things all work. I mean, there's no doubt. My pre-shot routine now is a modification of Mr. Short Game and Robin Matthews Williams. I swing on my practice swing, but before the club head gets down, I'm already looking down the fairway. It's kind of a no look. It's kind of hitting with the ear that uh, Mr. Short Game told me about. And these things work. They get you in the rhythm. They get you thinking, shot finishing the shot instead of ball 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 the ball and your mind are the only two things that screw you up in this game the rest of it is pretty natural most people know how to swing something at something you can take a ball and you can just chuck it and i landed that on the bed where i wanted to now i'm going to land on the plastic listen okay that was the floor but i've generally got a feel for this <laughs> somebody mentioned in one of the comments i've seen somewhere about we should study strokes gain statistics to really become a better golfer that this type of system doesn't work in the long term but to be honest it works i've played golf with 15 handicap plus uh, for the i don't know better part of 20 years in every group i've ever been in there's always been a guy who's over 15 handicap and in general i've, ne I've hardly ever played with people under the handicap of five unless it was an amateur golf event for the region in south africa and the number one thing that helps guys is hitting their most comfortable, simple shots at any given moment. And there's nothing more that helps that than to hit your three, four, or five most reliable clubs. I mean, you don't need statistics. You don't need brain surgery to understand this. It's literally put the ball where you can hit it from most comfortably and enjoy your round. And with the enjoyment comes a relaxation and the knowledge knowing that you are going to hit a great shot and you're going to reduce your scores. I don't need to study special statistics for that. Easy life. And to Mr. Tom Kude, Kud, I'm not sure how to say your name, but sir, in Japan, I understand that you've lost a lot of money playing golf and it's been a very traumatic experience for you. And I'm very happy to hear that you came first the other day, you won 400 bucks and you got your name on a trophy. Well done, player.